So it's hard for me to make it up as I go when he records me, and I think he does it on purpose. Used to, it was easy to make this up as I go. And then he puts the engineers over to the left of me to uh, keep me in check. So most everything I will say will be factual. Sometimes I'll throw something in there that may not be true just to see if they catch it. Um, so power fencing and the function and how do we make it work. How many of y'all have used some type of electric fencing before? Okay, pretty good number. And of those of you that raised your hand, how many of you have always had to work to your satisfaction most of the time? Wow. There's usually about one in every group that's like, mm, yeah, I have. And the rest of the people are like, oh, no, I can't. Power fence, electric fence doesn't work for me. So that's great. We've got some that may be a little bit easier to, um, to persuade that we can make power fencing, electric fencing work. The first thing that we have to understand is that electric fence, power fence, is a psychological barrier. Now, that is a different end of the spectrum from what Clay talked to you about on effective physical fencing or some of the things that Morgan got into with your woven wire, plank fence, barbed wire. Those are all physical barriers. What we found is that in the, in the U.S. anyway, in the late 70s, that high tensile fence smooth wire did not make a very good physical barrier. Even if you put up 10 or 12 strands of it, four inches apart, banjo string tight, because if you did get a little bit of slack, then animals could walk through it. So we started in the late 70s, early 80s, applying some of the concepts that came out of New Zealand where electric fencing was invented, the Energizer was invented. So we could take about a third of those multi-strands of smooth wire high tensile, which is very efficient and um, cost-effective to put up, take about a third as many of those strands as the non-electrified fence, electrify them, and have a very, very effective psychological barrier. And in some cases, if it's done right, can be more effective than the physical barrier. We know that power fence works when installed properly because we use it on all these critters. And we use this at every, just about every zoo you can drive from, um, drive to from West Louisville, Kentucky in a day's time, and around the world for that matter. And we use electric fencing as the primary barrier that is a lot of times disguised as weeds and grass and vines to keep these zoo animals back before they get to the physical barrier, which could be a big elaborate um, moat system or big cable fences, something like that. But we can use the electric fence as the primary barrier to discourage them from pushing on the physical barrier. But there's one thing you got to keep in mind. They're using the same products and techniques and concepts is what all of us can use as livestock producers. But good chance that Animal Kingdom at Disney is not using an old piece of cut up water hose for an insulator. And nobody here would do that. You may have some neighbors that would do things like that or use a tire, you know, on a corner post, let your electric wire run around um, or crazy things. You know, you're not going to find the, the Nashville Zoo on the giraffe exhibit using copper wire that was intended for 600 volts on their lead out to go from the energizer to the giraffe fence. They're not going to use copper wire with 600 volt rating on it. Uh, now my neighbor has done that before and hasn't always worked out well for him. So don't take shortcuts and expect your fence to work as effectively as what we have to make it work for these wild critters. But what we do know is if you build a proper system and incorporate a few different concepts, whether it's permanent or temporary or permanent and temporary both together, then it leads to a whole nother world of opportunities. And in this case, this is a, a blend of a permanent electrified high tensile with a secondary fence system made up of temporary polywire fencing that then allowed the dynamics on this farm to change because of electric fence, because of power fencing, person who runs the farm is making the decisions, not the cows. So we've taken electric fencing, changed the dynamics. In this case, I'm the one making the decisions, not my cows, and I'm able to graze stockpile fescue in December when my neighbors are feeding hay. And that's all possible because I'm the one in control using a single strand psychological barrier.
So if we know we can do it on these critters, there shouldn't be any reason why we can't do it on, on cattle. Now, how many folks here are something other than cattle? Small ruminants, goats, okay. Um, horses, goats, what's, okay. And I always ask that because I'm, I'm a cattle producer and sometimes I get straight off and talk specifically about cattle, but we can use the same concepts for small ruminants, um, alpacas in, in Morgan's case, and especially for horses. So we can make it work on these ladies, and this is my farm, and I'm not quite far enough away from home to be considered an expert. Now, when I go to, to East Kentucky, then I'm, what, what's the limit, Dr. Torch? 200 miles away, you're an expert? That, and a tie, okay. Yeah, so I'm not 200 miles away, I'm not wearing a tie. This is my farm in southern Muhlenberg County, um, and... If there's a mistake that can or could have been made, then um, my wife has made that mistake when it comes to electric fencing. And, and I've learned from her mistakes. So um, when we're talking about electric fencing, there's a few questions you need to ask yourself, and this is part of the planning phase as well. What are you keeping in? What are you keeping out? For you folks that are small ruminant producers, that's extremely important, keeping critters out. Um, are you going to incorporate a portable fence in the system? Or are you talking about a strictly a permanent perimeter or a permanent multi-strand cross fence? All of those things you have to take in consideration because power fence is a system. Now we can take a fence charger and some old rusty wire and some halfway broken insulators and cobble them all together and call that electric fence, but is that a system? And don't forget your rusty piece of rebar to ground it to. Is that a system? No. There are many parts to a system, any system, and they all have to work together for the system to work. So with electric fencing, we've got the energizer, the hot box, the fencer, whatever you want to call it, the electrified system itself, so the components, the wire, the insulators, the underground cable, cutout switches, that's one part of the system. And then the most overlooked, as Morgan alluded to, is the grounding system. And the grounding system is not only the most overlooked, but it is the cheapest part of the system to improve on. And as livestock owners, we like cheap, don't we? Everybody likes cheap. Well, this is one thing you can do with your fence system that is cheap and effective is to improve your ground system. We'll talk about grounding a little bit more. And then also, the, the one thing that ties a lot of these parts together is your lead out. So don't take all the right steps on your energizer, your grounding, and build a good quality insulated system and then skimp on your lead out because that's the wire that connects everything together because your failures can occur there, especially if you're using an old piece of rusty wire or a piece of copper wire joining up to a galvanized fence system. So if one part of the system fails, they all fail. When we talk about energizers, um, use only low impedance energizers for electric fence, especially if you are going to use some type of poly products. And, that gets into a whole different conversation for a different day, and if you haven't been to uh, UK's grazing school, then it looks like they are going to start happening again this fall and next spring, so between Versailles and Princeton, keep, keep an eye on that. We do a little section on temporary fencing at grazing school. Um, so if you're going to use poly products, use a low impedance energizer. Most every company now makes a low impedance energizer. The alternative to that would be solid state. There are still a few companies that make solid state energizers, and that technology is extremely old and antiquated. It was not made to work with poly wires, and it was not made to work with weed and grass loads because the power would stay on the fence just a fraction too long, and that blade of grass that touches your poly wire could heat up and cause your poly wire to melt. And in some cases, the old technology would actually start grass fires. Um, especially the old weed burners, because the power would stay on the fence for a long time on those weed burners, if, you, if you've ever remembered those or had one of those, because it would just be a buzz and then a pause and a long buzz. So low impedance, we're talking about 10 thousandths of, of a second. That's how long the power is on the wire. Now it's an every second or second and a half pulse interval, but just thousandths of a second. Most companies are about three one thousandths of a second. Um, that is not long enough for grass and weeds to heat up or to form a short in the fence because that blade of grass is a ground. It's attached to the soil with, with the root system. 
and you get one blade of grass, no big deal. You get several blades of grass and you, you've got a short on your system unless you can overpower it. Low impedance technology will not fry, burn, smoke weeds. It will dehydrate. So what you'll see over time is you'll see a brown, especially on, on tall fescue in the springtime when it starts to hit an electrified fence, a properly built system, you'll start to see a little bit of a yellow tinge on the, on the leaf and then it'll eventually turn brown and it'll dehydrate and die off. Um, so we can't overcome some weed load. You are going to have to do a little bit of maintenance. So low impedance, especially if you're going to use poly wire, low impedance is now extremely easy to find. The tough question is what size and how do I compare? And we're talking about energizers, electric fence boxes. How do you compare? Because you've got all these ratings. You've got mileage, acreage, stored joules, output joules, super shock them, burn the hooves off hot. Um, you've got ratings across different companies. You've got ratings across different countries. And in New Zealand, where electric fence was invented, you can take, there's, there's several companies that are manufactured there. Uh, the company I work for included, you can take an Energizer made in New Zealand, same components, same everything, you bring it to the U.S. and you put it in different packaging and the ratings change from what it would be in New Zealand. I'm not just talking about from hectares to acres or, or kilometers to miles, but when you compare apples to apples, the ratings in the U.S. always go up and there's really no reason for that other than marketing. And I guess in the U.S. we have to try to outdo each other on who's got the biggest and who can do the most miles. So let's look at miles. Consider the accuracy of mileage ratings for electric fence chargers. So if we take the mileage ratings on the packaging that a marketing department has placed on the packaging and it says four miles. So I can buy a four mile energizer for $75. Four miles, I just a little energizer won't do much. It's only $75, right? Well, if I take that $75 fence charger over to Missouri, where everything's laid out in nice big square sections, because we know square pieces of ground have less perimeter than rectangular, and square is always gonna be constant. So if I go to a section of ground, square section, and I start my pickup truck at the beginning and I drive around all four sides of 640 acres, that's a section, my odometer is going to say four miles when I get back to the beginning. One mile by one mile by one mile square. So a four mile fence charger that you buy for $70 in, in most cases should do 640 acres if the ratings are accurate. Right? Does anybody believe that? Should I be able to do 640 acres of electric fence with a $75 fence charger? Probably not, but let's take it one step further. So as, as industries, we like to compete with each other and just give big numbers. So what if I had a 100 mile fence charger? Whoo, boy, it's a hot one. 100 mile fence charger, I'd do several pieces of, of a farm. Well, put it in perspective, if you go a little bit further out west and where they're grazing or their, their farms or ranches or multi-sections. If I take a 400,000 acre ranch, because if it's 400,000 acres, it'd probably be somewhere where they would call it a ranch and be proud of it to call it a ranch. So if I take 400,000 square acres and I start at the beginning of it and get in my pickup truck and set the trip meter and drive around all four sides that are square, when I get back to the beginning, my odometer is going to say 100 miles. Is it realistic that if I go to the farm store down the road here and buy a 100-mile fence charger that it will do 400,000 acres of fence? You make your own judgment, but let's just I'm, just, I'm just giving you the math. And Dr. Jackson hasn't jumped up and blew his whistle yet, so I think I'm, 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 on, to, I'm on to something here. So one thing that we can measure and one thing that we are held accountable to as a company in the industry is joules. Joules are like horsepower on a tractor. Um, John Deere and Case, they can't fudge the, the numbers. They can't tell you that a tractor is 120 horsepower when it's really just 50 horsepower. So joules are a measurement that can be quantified with electric fence. Joules are just like horsepower on a tractor. They don't confuse joules with, with voltage. We'll talk about that later. So joules are something that 
The more joules you buy, the more money it costs, just like a tractor. The more horsepower, the more money it costs. So let's say, okay, we can, we can measure joules. We can keep these companies accountable by not letting them fib to us on joules. So surely somebody's got some kind of magic formula that they can say, okay, this many horsepower, this many joules will do this many miles of fence. So we look at, so we look at some companies, because we know companies will lie to us and exaggerate, and some of the companies will say, well, about 0.2 joules will do a mile of fence, and some companies say 0.1, which is half as many. Um, and say, so, well, let's, let's forget the companies. Let's look at Extension and RCS, because they do their own independent research. Well, turns out, make a long story short, Extension and NRCS across the U.S. can't even agree on how many joules per mile the defense charger will do. Some say one joule per mile, a little more conservative. Some say 0.2 joules per mile. So all that rambling was to tell you that there is no answer on how many joules per mile because it depends. It depends on the length of the fence, the electrified system, but also the weed and grass load, how many bad faulty insulators you've got how many connections you make, how many joint clamps you've got that are rusted, if you're, if you're jumping your wire by twisting it on or if you're jumping it by crimping or clamping it. Uh, there's all these variables that go into place because my farm in Muhlenberg County may be the exact same size and scenario and have the same energizer as Jody's farm in Jackson, Tennessee, but we're gonna have two different situations. So my energizer may not work on his farm in Jackson, Tennessee, because he's using things like rubber water hoses and old oil jugs nailed to trees for insulators, because that's what his neighbors will do that. He doesn't do that, but his neighbors do. Um, so it's gonna take a bigger energizer. It may just, he may just need to, to go and wad it all up and start over again if he's doing crazy things like that. So it depends. But you know you're buying joules when you spend money on a fence charge. Now, joules are not the same as volts. Just like horsepower is not the same as RPMs when you look at the tack on your tractor. Because I can take a big tractor and a little tractor, park them side by side out here in the yard beside this building. I can take a 3000 Ford and a 4020 John Deere, park them side by side. One's 30 something horsepower, the other one's 100 ish horsepower. Is that pretty accurate? 40, 20, about 100 is horsepower, okay. I can put a 20 foot disc behind both of those tractors. One's 30 horsepower, one's 100. I can drive around all day long in the yard with that 20 foot disc and maintain my RPMs at a reasonable level until I pick the wheels up on the disc, until I load the tractor. The low horsepower tractor, 3,000 Ford, my RPMs, will start dropping, dropping, dropping until it coughs and puffs out some black smoke and stalls out and dies. The 4020 John Deere, when I pick the wheels up, add the load, RPMs may stutter a little bit, but it's gonna maintain its RPMs and keep pulling the load until somebody asks me why in the world I'm disking up their yard um, with a tractor. So, voltage is similar to RPMs. If I have a big joule energizer and a small joule energizer, I can maintain my voltage, my RPMs, as long as I don't apply a load. When I start applying a load, if that load becomes too big for the small energizer, my voltage drops and my energizer fails. So have enough horsepower to carry your load. I'm not going to get too deep in technical terms. This is in the... trying to save a little bit of time. The, this information is in your binder as well. There's a, there's a fence manual on the back of it. Uh, a lot of the terms we use when talking about electric fence, because there is a science behind it, is very similar to hydraulics when it comes to water pressure or water volume or water flow. Um, voltage, if there, so voltage is like water pressure. If there is no voltage on the fence, the electricity can't flow. If you take the pressure off of a water system, the water just sits stagnant in the pipe and doesn't move. So we have to have voltage on the fence to make the electricity flow. Voltage is where the shock comes from, but your joules are where the pain from the shock comes from. Joules are your horsepower. And the technical measurement would be a joule is one watt for one second. Um, but essentially, joules are your horsepower. This is where the pain comes from when the animal gets shocked. 
when we talk about voltage and amperage on modern energizers, modern fence systems, we are speaking about milliamps. Milliamps, but high voltage. The plug-in on the wall is low voltage and high amps. And it's a constant. There's no pulse to it, and that's what makes it lethal. What makes modern technology energizers safe is it's milliamps and it pulses. It may be six, 8,000 volts, but it's a safe, effective shock that when an animal or a five-year-old who does not do this anymore, when he first touched the poly wire behind the house, he received a very memorable, safe, effective shock. And he learned from that, didn't hurt him. I get shocked probably once a month at home on a piece of poly wire or something because I try to hold it over my head going under gates, driving a four-wheeler at the same time. And, but it's a safe shock. The pulsing is one of those reasons. Morgan mentioned one of the reasons, there's some safety reasons why we don't want to electrify barbed wire. If you electrify a barbed wire, even though it's a safe shock, it's not going to fry or electrocute something or somebody, but you can get entangled in it and you keep receiving that shock every, every second, second and a half then that can cause some asphyxiation and suffocation with, with animals. So that's why we talk about not electrifying barbed wire. Animals can't get away from it between pulses. Power supply options. Um, the moral of this story is if you can use 110 volt plug in the wall, use 110 volt plug in the wall power. You get four to six times as much power for the same money if you can use 110 volt. This is gonna be the most maintenance free. It's also going to be the cheapest horsepower per dollar. The alternative would be battery, so battery only, which is going to require an external battery. In most cases, that has to be recharged on your account at a separate location. Take the battery out, charge it in tool shed, swap it out with another one. You're going to have to do that. Depending on the energizer, you may have to do it once a week or once every two months. So batteries and alternative adds a little more cost. The most cost per horsepower, the most cost per joule, is going to be with solar, especially with the self-contained solars, the ones you pick up off the shelf at the farm store that have the battery mounted in the back of them already. You're paying the most dollar to get one joule of energy out of those energizers, and a lot of times they're less than a joule. But you're paying for the energizer itself, you're paying for the battery, and you're paying for the solar system and also the technology inside that, that module that monitors the, the, the solar output and the battery draw. So there's a lot of things that go into consideration. If you have to use solar, make sure you're sizing it accordingly and keep in mind that you're going to spend four to six times as much on the solar to get the same amount of power out of it as if you would if you could go with 110 volt. So if you've got $200 to spend in your budget, and you have the option to go with plug-in, you're gonna get a lot more power for that same $200. A lot of those small gel celled um, solar setups are great for temporary fencing or for 20, 30 acres worth of multi-strand, but if you try to put them on large acreages, large areas, then they're not gonna be able to keep that load up. So how does the animal get shocked? Why is grounding important and, and um, Morgan, hit on these with a few slides. I'm not gonna, not gonna repeat everything she said, but in an all hot system, the way the animal gets shocked is they, so this cow walks up to a three strand all hot fence, touches the fence, electricity goes down through that cow's nose, down through her legs, down through the soil, back to the ground system. And when that happens, and of course the ground system is connected to the ground on the energizer. That's how it has to be connected. When the animal does that, the animal completes the circuit and receives a shock. And it's almost an instant shock, but the animal has to be grounded well, the energizer has to be grounded well, and that completes the circuit. Now, this is very effective in most every case from Kansas to the east US. Uh, we have the right soil composition. Even in a drought year, the soil composition we have in Kentucky and Tennessee and Indiana especially, uh, we can make this happen if the ground system is built properly, because this is your antenna. The alternative to a hot ground system is a, or the, to an all hot system is a hot ground system. Now for a true hot ground system to work, in this case, 
in this illustration, there are three wires. The top one is electrified, the bottom one is electrified, and you can see the red line that connects to a cutout switch to the energizer, to the hot terminal on the energizer. Now the center wire is a ground. It's not a neutral. It's not just there for, for, for visual preference. It is an actual ground that is connected to the ground system that the energizer is physically connected to. So with a true hot ground system, what happens when I get to a gateway? I have to go under my gateway with my ground wire and my hot wire because that ground wire, that middle wire in this case, must be continuously connected back to the ground rods, back to the energizer ground. In this situation, when an animal touches hot and ground, it's almost an instant shock. It's like the old cow walking up there and putting her nose on the red and reaching her tongue out and touching the green. It's an instant shock. You're relying on wire to make the, the physical connection and not so much on the soil. You still get some on the soil. One of the drawbacks of the hot ground system, in my opinion, is especially if you're going to go through, through um, woods, if I have a tree limb overnight fall on the all hot system. So a tree limb is very, very um, insulative. It's not very conductive. So a tree limb falls, it mashes the top wire and the second wire together. And we still have a lot of tree limbs fall after the ice storm. Here it is, however many years later. I tried to forget what year that was, but it still comes back to haunt me every now and then. So after the ice storm of 08 or 09, trees are still dying, limbs are still falling on, it, it, on my farm, and I'll have the top two wires of my fence touching several times a year. No big deal. I've got two hot wires touching. The tree limb that's laying on the ground is having very little effect because that tree limb is not conducting a lot of electricity. Now on a hot ground system, if a tree limb falls and takes the top wire and connects it to the middle wire, guess what that is? Somebody say dead short. Dead short. It's just like taking a screwdriver, going to the energizer, and going from hot to ground because that's what's happening because it's a true hot ground system and that ground wire is actually connected back to the energizer. It has to be to make it effective. Now what I also see a lot of is fence systems built in Kentucky and Tennessee that are multi-strand but every strand is not hot but there are some other strands that may be called ground but they really don't ground anything. They're just kind of a neutral they're just there to hold the earth together, I guess, because they're not connected all the way back to the ground rods that's connected to the energizer. That is a lot of conductivity wasted, in my opinion, from an electrical science standpoint, because if we can do things with those wires other than just leave them there neutral because the neighbor did it that way or the other, other contractor did it that way. If you're going to have wires that are not hot, make sure they're actually grounded to the ground system of the energizer to make a true hot ground. In 15 years in Kentucky and Tennessee doing this, I've seen two, maybe three true hot ground systems. And I've seen a lot of fence built in Kentucky and Tennessee. I've seen two that were actually true hot ground systems. I see a lot that are six strands of fence, four of them hot, two of them be what they call ground, but it's just a neutral and maybe have a ground rod driven here and there around the farm, but it's, it's not connected back. So uh, if you're going to build it, build it right. Build a true hot ground system. Otherwise, make them all hot and your fence will be more conductive, and I'll, I'll show you why here in a minute. Um, so the minimum rule, Morgan, hit on this. The minimum is three ground rods, six foot deep, ten foot apart. That's not Jeremy McGill. That's not Gallagher. That is every extension service in the country nearly and NRCS, every NRCS spec from state to state, including national spec, that's the recommendation. Now the exception to the rule, and I cringe to even mention exceptions, the exception to the rule would be if you're using a solar energizer with a roll or two of say turbo wire on a reel with some step-in post, and you're just electrifying a small section of fence to do some rotational grazing. If 
you are relatively close to your portable solar energizer, then you probably could get away with one ground rod. Dr. Jackson, am I leading them astray with that? Is that okay that we break the exception of the three ground rod rule for temporary purposes? On a small area. Okay. It would be okay, but he would prefer you to do the recommendation and use three ground rods. And you can get temporary ground rods that are easy to pull up. So you can get three foot T-handle ground rods that are not, obviously they're not the six foot that's recommended, but a three foot T-handle, you can pull it up easy. And that's better than just having one single ground rod. So the point of this is grounding is extremely important. That's how the animal gets shot. That's the cheapest addition we can put on our fence system to make it more effective. A couple things not to do. Don't use copper rods or copper wire. Leave that to the electricians. Is anybody here an electrician? Be honest with me. Nobody here is an electrician. Okay. Keep the electricians away from your electric fence system. It's a different, it's a different concept than what they're used to working with. Um, no, nothing against electricians, but I've seen some electric fence systems that the electricians got involved in. It's just been a... The engineers would have a, a fun time dealing with some of those. Um, copper does not like other metals. If I take a copper rod with a copper ground rod, a copper wire, and connect that to my galvanized energizer terminal, there's my problem. It will eat it a lot. It'll, I've seen it happen as quick as a year or two. Um, that it'll just it'll just disintegrate the terminal. If I have a galvanized terminal or a stainless steel terminal, it's still copper doesn't like stainless either. But if I've got a galvanized terminal, galvanized wire, and then I go to a copper rod, I get my electrolysis at the rod. So two different types of metal when you run electricity through it, expose it to ambient conditions, um, will corrode. And copper is a great conductor, but copper is such a great conductor it hates everybody else. It doesn't want to be doesn't want to touch other metals. But you can put all these salves and dielectric greases and possum juice and everything else on it that may slow it down. But the easiest thing to do is just don't use copper. Now, if you've got copper fence wire, then you can use a copper lead out going to your copper fence wire. But I know in my part of the country you won't have copper fence wire for very long. Um, just, so. The fact is, most fences are made out of galvanized wire. Use galvanized wire for your fence, galvanized wire for your lead out going to the energizer to power it. Use a galvanized wire going to your ground system. Use galvanized rods. And you don't have to worry about electrolysis. Keep everything the same metal. Also, if I go to this building, fairly, fairly nice, new, beautiful, modern building, and I find the ground system at the electrical panel, and I clip the ground system, clip the ground wire. Do these lights stay on? Will the lights stay on in this building? If I go outside and see where the ground rod's driven outside of the, the service meter, if I clip that ground wire, do the lights stay on? Of course they stay on. Because the ground for 110 volt power or 220 or for whatever, the ground for our AC power is for safety reasons. You can probably drive around Davis County and find some old farmsteads, some old farmhouses that still have power hooked to them or old tool sheds that haven't had a ground wire hooked up to them in 40 years. Maybe the bush hogs got a little close to it or, or the, the lawnmowers got a little close to it 40, 11 times and it finally just rotted off or got nicked off. And the lights still work. So we don't have to have a ground to make AC power work, but with an electric fence, we have to have a ground to make it work. It's not for safety. There's safety built into the energizer itself. The ground is to shock the animal. And if we skimp on that, if we take shortcuts, we don't effectively shock the animal. So keep that separate. The point of that story is keep that separate from your tool shed ground, your barn ground. Don't connect your energizer to your tool shed ground. One, because it's probably going to be copper. We know not to do that. But also, the tool shed ground is for safety and the energizer ground is to shock the animal. And guess what happens when that cow walks up to the fence and touches it? See these electrons? That's power flowing. That power flows through these ground rods. These ground rods get hot when the cow touches the fence. You don't want your tool shed ground to get hot every time a cow touches the fence. Now it's a, it's a split second of a hot, 
keep those two separate. It'll, it'll stop some issues later on down the road too. So it's like your antenna. It's a big difference between dish network and rabbit ears. A poor ground system is like having rabbit ears. You're not going to pick up teeth. Uh, it's kind of encouraging to, as I do more of these talks, I get some people look at me crazy when I say rabbit ears, and I realize that I'm starting to, once I've hit that 40s range, I'm, I'm, I'm probably the last element that remembers rabbit ears. Um, so rabbit ears on a TV couldn't pick up a signal from very far away. We could get Nashville from, from Muhlenberg County if everything was just right. Well, that's like having an old rusty piece of rebar as an antenna on my fence system. I can maybe shock my cows most times of the year if the conditions are right, but if the conditions aren't right, I can't reach out and properly shock my animals. That's a poor ground system. Now, there was a time where we could take rabbit ears and put a little aluminum foil around them and definitely pick up Nashville a lot better, especially certain times of the year. However, I can also take some a grinder and some sandpaper and I can grind all the rust off my rebar and make that rebar a little more conductive, my old rusty rebar ground rod, but I still can't pick up a signal like I can with Dish Network. Because Dish Network, I mean, I could reach way out and pick up satellites and watch TV from anywhere in the world if I want to with three ground rods, six foot deep, 10 foot apart, put in like the engineers tell us to, I can reach out and pick up a signal further across the farm. Lead out and resistance, um, the key point here, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the field. Um, don't use small wire to lead out from the energizer if your fence wire is a larger diameter. It's just like water. You never would start out with a three quarter inch water line running from your water meter going across your farm to your cattle waterers. You wouldn't start out with three quarter and then dump that into an inch and a half pipe and hook that up to a mirror fount. You would start out with your big water line first and then as you get closer to your, to your end point, you would go down to inch or maybe three quarter and you would size it properly. You always start big and go small. Same way with electricity on electric fence. Start out with the larger wire first. So if I'm using 12 and a half gauge lead out, galvanized lead out, that's okay to go into a 12 and a half gauge electric fence wire. And then from there, I could spur off with that with poly wire, or turbo wire, or something temporary but never start out with some little rusty 17 gauge lead out and try to dump all that power into a 12 and a half gauge high tensile, it's a choke point. You can't get your full potential out. As a matter of fact, you can't even overcompensate for it with a large jewel energizer. There's some things that, that throw more power at can't, can't even cure. So resistance and wire, the larger the wire, the better. The larger the wire, the easier it is to electrify. One of the hardest things in the world to electrify is that little 17 gauge on the verge of, and I'll just go ahead and can I just call it junk? A little 17 gauge junk you buy that rusts after about three years that the animals can't see, deer can't see, they just run through it, especially after it rusts in two years. So the 17 gauge is very hard to electrify compared to the 12 and a half gauge high tensile because that electricity travels around the circumference of the wire. So there's more circumference around a piece of 12 and a half gauge wire for that electricity to flow fl freely around than what it is around a piece of 17 gauge wire. There's not as much area around the outside of it. Larger wire carries more power for longer distances. And that also brings us into another interesting point that's a matter of electrical principles that in even though Dr. Jackson has left the scene, then he will back me up on this. If you have one strand of 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire, that is 56 ohms per mile. That's the resistance. And notice Morgan mentioned that we want zero ohms of resistance because it lets power flow freely. So 56 is, that's the standard for 12 and a half gauge high tensile. It's one strand. Zero is where we want to be. That's no resistance. If I have two strands of 12 and a half gauge high tensile connected together in parallel, so with that end of the stretch where I build a brace assembly, I jump the top two strands up, the top strand, bottom strand up and down. 
I come down here, build a brace assembly, jump the top strand, bottom strand. That's in parallel. If I do that, now my resistance is at, that wasn't good. Okay, now my resistance is at 28 ohms per mile. Is 28 smaller than 56? Is 28 closer to zero than 56? So look what I've just done. On that mile of fence, by adding another strand, I have made that fence twice as conductive because I connected it at both ends parallel. What if I had a four strand fence and two of them were hot? I'm at 28 ohms per mile. That's pretty close to zero, that's good. But what if those other two strands are just sitting there neutral, holding the world together? They're not actually serving a purpose as a ground wire. They're just, they're just there. Contractor built it, he saved me another nickel or something on insulators because he didn't have to insulate those wires. If I were to take a four strand fence with two hot, electrify all four strands, I'm now at 14 ohms per mile that's twice as conductive as the two strand, four times as conductive as the one strand, and I can carry more power for longer distances if it's hooked in parallel. More wires carry more power for longer distances. This is why I'm a big proponent of a multi-strand, all hot fence without these neutral wires that are just there for whatever reason holding the world together that are serving no purpose. Because you still had to pay to, to, to have that wire paid out and stapled to the post or, or tied off on the ends. And for a few more cents per foot, you could have insulated those extra wires and had a very, very conductive fence. More wires carry more power for long, longer distances. Protect your investment. Easy ways to protect that is a lightning diverter. Surge protector on the 110 volt plug inside and an adequate ground system. Lightning diverter, we see most damage come from the plug inside, from surges. Now, lightning diverters help prevent damage from lightning strikes. When you get a lightning strike, it's usually some pretty, pretty nasty damage. That's when fence chargers get blown off the barn wall and you can smell melted plastic. Lightning diverters help prevent that, but the fact is most of the damage that, that we see in Kansas City is um, damage that comes in from the 110 volt side, which is just small surges that'll knock some electrical component out. So that's one drawback to 110 volt is you're more prone to surges, but you're getting more power for less money. So if you do that, use a surge protector on your 110 volt and size your surge protector according to what you paid for your system. No different than on a real nice flat, or I guess now a curved screen TV. If you spend a thousand dollars on one of these fancy curved screen TVs that are 40, 11 inches wide with all kinds of sound built into them, you spend a thousand dollars on that TV, spend 20 or 30 on a good surge protector to protect that. If you spend five or six hundred dollars on your fence charger, then spend 15, 20, 30 dollars on a surge protector to protect that. And back to the good old cheap things, an adequate ground system protects us against lightning better. As a matter of fact, we have, as a company, we've sponsored many, many um, postgraduate students in some of the New Zealand universities to study electrical theory for some of our research. And we found in many cases that um, a lightning diversion system built out of your ground rods is extremely effective. If you drive your ground rods in a star pattern, so if you're in a lightning prone area, if you, if you use electric fence and just have lightning strike after lightning strike after lightning strike, then you can take your ground rods, drive them in a star pattern, put a central ground rod, have your energizer connected to that, and then all your other rods connected to that central rod. That is superior lightning protection, and it's cheap to do because you're talking $10 range for a galvanized rod and high tensile wire, which you can use to, to connect everything's two and a half cents a foot. So ground systems help protect against lightning. Rusty pieces of rebar do not help protect against lightning if that's what you're using for your ground system. Your neighbor, I mean, if your neighbor does that, then he, he or she doesn't have a very good ground system. Uh, and I used to have to watch out because my neighbor, I used to talk about my neighbor all the time when giving examples, and my neighbor actually came to a fence school 
one time that, that our agent uh, in Muhlenberg County had, and about the second time I slipped up, um, I saw him kind of cracking a smile. So it, it, it all worked out well. But uh, my neighbor is not here today, so I can talk about my neighbor. Layout and design, uh, Clay hit on that. Uh, Dr. Jackson will hit on some of these uh, cool tools we can use from a mapping standpoint. Um, I use I use some of these tools he's going to talk about all the time on my farm if it just comes to how am I going to divide up my stockpile fescue this year? Am I going to try to pull a different direction to stop some animal trails or whatever? And I can measure distances uh, with a click of a mouse on a computer. And I guess now it's even easier to use your phone to do it. Um, some take home points, bigger the wire the better. Larger diameter wires, better. Use good quality plastics. We'll talk about that out in the field. UV stabilized plastics. Don't mix your metals. Don't mix copper and galvanized together. Just don't do it. Um, copper hates other metals and just keep, keep let your electrician use copper um, on, your, on your house wiring. Power fence is a system. Don't take shortcuts and expect an effective system. Now we can shock through weeds and grass with modern low impedance technology, but we can't perform miracles. If this is your electric fence, there, you, may, you may have a problem. So we can dehydrate light grass and weed loads, but we can't shock through thickets. So you may need to get the herbicide out or um, get your neighbor to come bring his, his weed whacker and, and work on that a little bit, because uh, we can't perform miracles. Don't let this grow up, and even if you've got a physical barrier, you wouldn't want to let your fence get grown up like that with woven wire or barbed wire over time either. Whew. Is anybody here a fence contractor that builds fence? Okay. Um, th these little rubber fin tube doodads, not good. There are thousands of faults in electric fence that have occurred over the years because of these little four inch tube insulators. You drive the staple in too tight, like you see on the bottom, it compromises the plastic. The one on top, that's a steeple. That steeple didn't get drove in tight enough, and the little plastic doodad falls out of the line. Um, so whether it's a steeple or a staple, then that's not a good design. Because when that falls out of the way, I've got to shorter my fence eventually, especially if I've got thousands of these on a farm. One's not going to make a difference, but if you get thousands of faults like that on a farm, you've got a problem. We'll talk about some of the other alternatives in the field. Um, General shortcuts, I mean, what in the world is going on here? I've got a rusty gate handle, and I've got these wonderful wraparound tube insulators that have cracked on the backside, and there's just a, I don't even want to talk about that. That's not, don't, ex, don't do things like that and expect your system to be effective. You're not going to find that at the Louisville Zoo on the grill exhibit, I guarantee you. Bracing, you'll, you'll be thinking about braces in your sleep tonight uh, after we get through in the field. And help us, I have no idea what's going on here, but I, I've been on farm calls before, and you know it's always the fence charger's fault, right? If something happens to the fence, we're going to call the 1-800 number on the person that made the fence charger, and it's their fault. Never mind that I've got this cobbled up mess here with, with who knows what's going on. So uh, some other common mistakes using poor quality materials that eventually rust on us, um, hot tubes. Why would I put an electrified wire at the top of my woven wire at 60 inches tall? Why would I put my barbed wire up there? Does anybody know? And I'm not talking about those of you who have giraffes that, that are constantly, giraffes love to reach over woven wire fences and eat on the other side. So if you don't have giraffes, why would you put a hot wire on top of your woven wire? Why would you put a barbed wire on top of your wire? We'll talk about that later this afternoon in the field. Because wouldn't it make more sense to put it down here where the cow is going to be grazing at or scratching their backside instead of putting it on top? So one of the things that, that we challenge you to do um, when Clay and Jody and I are showing you some different techniques is challenge you to question just because of something has been done this way forever, or if this is the way it's always been done in this region of West Kentucky, is there a reason? Or was it done that way because somebody did it once and everybody else said, well, it must be right because the neighbor's been doing it. So think about those things. Uh, and that is a Jackson, Tennessee corner post assembly right there. So 
That is on that is on Jody. That's on Jody's farm. Um, and actually, it's it's not. That's my buddy in Texas took that picture or sent that picture to me. Uh, that is a true Texas corner assembly using a rubber tire. Rubber tires are not good insulators. That man's fence did not work properly. This mess here. I mean, we've got it all. We've got all of the let's go to fence school and do everything we were told not to do. Um, zip ties, PVC pipe, T-post, a broken yellow insulator, and thank goodness we had some spare water hose laying around. Don't expect that system to work. Um, in the case anybody was curious, that is not on my farm. Uh, my wife knows better than the fence like that now. That may have possibly been on a UK research farm at one point in time. And I may have gotten a call from the, one of the people that had been to the grazing schools numerous times and knew how to do electric fencing and called and said, we can't get our research where we're doing these grazes. We just can't get the fence hot where we got these grazing trials set up. I said, well, send me some pictures, Tom. And he sent me the pictures and I just, so I better stop talking about that. Um, so is the future here? Dr. Jackson's going to show you some crazy things. I'm going to give you a little taste of it. Knowledge is power, and as the technology and farming changes, the livestock industry is te technically the or typically the ones the last ones to catch up. Because for those of you who are dual with with row crops and livestock, you know how much technology is has changed things. We can do that now on the livestock side, on the fencing side, with knowledge and having the power of knowing the knowledge and what's going on with our farm. So I can have a, a simple setup, and this is all pretty simple, uh, and the technology is, is extremely cheap now compared to 10 years ago. So I can have a setup on my phone where I can be standing in West Louisville and know exactly what's going on at my house in Muhlenberg County on my fence. I can be on the other side of the country in New Zealand and have access to Wi-Fi or a phone signal, and I can tell when my fence voltage drops down below a point that I set it at. So if my fence voltage runs 7,000 volts, I can set an alarm for 6.5 thousand. If my what's fence, like? what's that? What's like? I don't have it hooked up. <laughs> you don't have it. No, I do have that, but it's not hooked up because I'm going to use it next week at the troubleshooting school. <laughs> so I've got it unhooked. But it does require, so this system would require Wi-Fi at your energizer. Now that could be as simple as if your energizer is close to your house, you pick up the Wi-Fi off your house, or we have a lot of producers in East Tennessee that use these systems in remote areas. They'll pay $15 extra on their phone bill and have a Wi-Fi router at their, their shop or their tool shed. But the point of this is we can now control a lot more from remote areas, not actually being on the farm and receive alerts and even turn the fence on and off from our smartphone. Um, and we're seeing more things in the livestock sector move to a cloud-based technology. Um, so this isn't all just cobble up some old rusty wire and some insulators and make the fence work. There's a lot of different moving parts and a lot of options we now have. Look at there, Dr. Toich. Finished 10 minutes, five minutes early. And started, th did I start? I guess, I, guess you're gonna, I guess you're gonna tell me I started 10 minutes early though, right? So I'll be around in the field after a while, and we'll, we'll do some hands-on, and afterwards I'll be around even longer if you have some more questions. So thank you. Thank you, Jim.